The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, hi everybody. This is Karen. Um, we're gonna we're gonna wait a couple of more minutes before we get started, just to see. Uh, we have several people who appear to be a little bit late <laughs> signing in for today, so we're gonna give them a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. For those of you who have just joined, uh, we are here. We're uh, waiting to see if we have a few more people who sign on. I'm gonna give that about another minute and then we'll get started. All right, um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get us going for the day. Hi everybody, this is Karen. Uh, and this month's webinar is on creating one page reports, a strategy for engaging busy readers. We have two guests today, Emily Perk and Lissa wilson Becho. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them and then pretty quickly turn things over to them. So Emma and Lissa are with Evaluate, which is housed at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. It is one of the NSF funded centers for the ATE program. Emma serves as co-PI and senior project manager. Lissa is a research assistant and working on her dissertation as a doctoral student in the interdisciplinary PhD and evaluation program. They both have a passion for making data accessible to all audiences through information design, data viz, and creative reporting. And so they have a lot in common with those of us on the call today, uh, since our community has been thinking a lot about reporting and data visualization on and off and in lots of different ways over the last couple of years. Um, Taylor, if you could go to the next slide. All right, so these are the goals for today. Um, they are gonna provide us with some tools and resources that we can all think about and, and hopefully use to create effective one-page reports. What I think is nice about that is that it gives you the opportunity or hopefully will give us the opportunity to think about reporting to specific and different audiences and using some of the other skills that we've gotten through other professional development that has happened through the Valfest project. And then they're gonna give some specific examples of things that have worked well in practice so that it's not just conceptual, it's things that have actually been used and have made a difference for people when it comes to reporting. And Taylor, if you'll go forward one more time. All right, so shout outs for today are gonna be a little bit unconventional compared to what we normally do. Um, these are really gonna serve more as announcements so as you know, we applied for supplemental funding um, 
to host a couple of extra annual meetings and to do some additional professional development. We have cleared the first giant hurdle, so we want to give a thank you and a shout out to Bob Russell um, for recommending that for funding. There is one more hurdle to jump, so we are not entirely funded yet, um, but we are hopefully well on the way and uh, hope to be able to have an official announcement to share very soon. The other thing I wanted to point out is the number of research panels that are going to be presented at the Science Event Summit in about three weeks. So there are going to be presentations, uh, three separate presentations that use our Valfest data. And then there are going to be four presentations from other researchers as well, all focused on similar topics. And so this is kind of cool because we're really beginning to see the number of us who are out and doing research and serious evaluation on these topics grow. So Todd is going to present on the role of scientists interactions and in festival ratings. You guys have already seen some of those results, but that will be a completely new analysis that he's been working on with a grad student from UNC. Catherine is going to present on uh, demographics of festival attendees and lots of different ways to think about identifying where we're making progress in serving underserved audience and where maybe we're not. That is actually going to be piggybacked with a panel presented by Monet Verbeek, who's one of the authors of the science typically converted article that came out in the fall. So Monet is going to be there to present those data and then we're going to have other panelists that talk about audience in different ways. Catherine is one of those. I'm going to be one of those. I'm going to show some of the first preliminary results that we have from the follow-up survey. We have about 900 responses to the follow-up survey that have been collected by our first handful of festivals this season and so you'll get a sneak peek at some of those results if you're able to attend. And then um, a vet is going to round out that group of presenters. She's going to talk about the UK perspective and some reflective practice work that they've been doing with their festival organizers to think critically about the audiences that they're reaching. Todd's panel is going to be part of a group of three. So he will present on the science findings that I mentioned earlier. Then Katie Stover is going to present on some of the work that she's been doing sneaking scientists as communicators into unexpected places. So some of those are like bars, but others are, are less expected, like the laundromat. Um, and scientists are there just to sort of strike up conversations with un unknowing members <laughs> of the public. And she's going to present on some best practices and lessons learned from that. And then Brianna Keyes is going to represent the guerrilla science team. NSF has funded guerrilla science recently, and they've started to do research on the kinds of audiences they're reaching through guerrilla science and some of the impacts that they're seeing. So we have an excellent lineup. We hope that we're going to get to see all of you there. Um, and if not, then let us know. We'll find a way to share those presentations with you later, at least the ones that we made as a team. With that, I am going to turn things over to Emma and Alyssa. So Taylor's going to hand over the controls. They are willing to field questions during the panel. So if you want to type those into the chat, Taylor's going to keep an eye on that as we go today. And then there will be time for questions and answers at the end of their panel as well. Emma and Lissa. Thanks, Karen. Let's see. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. All right, wonderful. There we go. All right. So thanks for the great introduction. It sounds like your community is doing some really wonderful work. And thank you to everyone joining us on today's webinar on creating one page reports. We hope that you can take some of this to further communication about the great work you're doing. So to start off, so you know a little bit more about us, here you can see Emma and myself preparing for the webinar today. So we join you from Western Michigan University, which is in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yes, there really is a place called Kalamazoo. And most of our work is funded by the National Science Foundation for a project called Evaluate. So Evaluate serves as an evaluation support center by holding webinars on evaluation such as this one, maintaining open access resource library, and curating a blog about STEM education evaluation. And so all of the materials that Evaluate creates are open access, including these. So you can see the slides, um, very similar to the ones we're using today, along with some of the handouts that will help you create your own one-pagers at evaluate.org slash one-pagers. So just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover in the next hour, so we're going to talk a little bit about what one-pagers are and why you might want to use them for your project. 
and we're going to walk through the steps of how you can create a one pager and finally wrap it all up with some tips and tricks um, about software we use and some really helpful things about creating a one pager on your own. And like Karen said, feel free to enter any questions into the chat along the way. We'll keep an eye on the box. We might answer them as we go. And we certainly have a question section at the end. All right, so before we jump in, we want to do a quick poll, getting to know, getting a sense of the reports that you guys are writing right now. So on average, you can type your answers in the chat box. On average, how long are the evaluation reports that you're creating? Or how long are the general reports that you're creating for your project to communicate your activities? Are they something like 10 pages? Are they closer to 20 pages? Are they 50 pages? We've even seen some evaluation reports that are like 100 pages plus. So Karen said about 30 pages. So just think about like what kind of reports are you creating right now and how you can integrate one page reports into that type of portfolio. So what are we really talking about when we say a one page report? Well, we are referring to a single document that summarizes data, findings, or recommendations. Generally, it's a standalone document that supplements a longer report, data set, or presentation and is intentionally kept to one page in order to really highlight key information to a specific audience for a predetermined purpose. So let's take a look at some real life examples of one page reports in actions. So here is a one page report that Emma and I created that communicates the summary data about a webinar that Lori Wingate and Michael Lezecki did for Evaluate. So you can see in one page a visual summary of how many people attended, who are those people, and some increases in their knowledge and some different things that we measured on our evaluation form after the webinar. Here's another example where a one page report can summarize a larger data set. So here, um, this one just looks at the different data points in this larger survey, but this only specifically about the types of evaluation in ATE projects. Here's another example of a one page report by Stephanie Wilkerson, and it's a really visual summary of the evaluation reports. The bright, she uses bright colors and graphics, which really catch readers' attention and maybe even pulls people in that might not otherwise learn about Science Festival Alliance. But not all one-page reports have to be highly visual. This one-page report was created by Cosgrove and Associates to answer a couple of frequently asked questions regarding the evaluation results at UAS Tech. It does a great job of communicating the key pieces of information, even though it's just using text. So all of these types of one-pagers can be created through the, the steps that we're going to talk about today. You can even use these steps to create longer reports. So this is an example of a report created by Emma for Path Tech Life in which she intentionally created a bunch of one-pagers that could go together as a full report. But this also allows individuals to take uh, certain pages out of the report as they might need or might want to use them. So why should you think about creating one-page reports? Well, we all have to admit that we are pretty overwhelmed by information on a daily basis. From the hundreds of emails in our inbox to the constant stream of news, some of us even wear a fitness tracker that gives us even more data, right? How much we stood, how much we walked or exercised every day. Data and information is really everywhere. Some days it seems to even bury us. So the implication for evaluation is to recognize the stakeholders, the people reading our reports, are overwhelmed by information too. So handing your client a 50-page report doesn't always ensure that they read the most important information results, never mind put them to good use. So most evaluators go into the field of evaluation in order to make a difference and in order to increase data-driven decision-making and have programs make changes based on the, the findings that you make. However, we're not really doing that if our long form reports are getting lost in the information overload and we're not getting the right information to the right people at the right time. So a one page report of just key information targeted at a specific audience can really catch readers attention. It's easily digestible and it fits within the busy, busy schedule of the stakeholders. An evaluation differs from research in its commitment to the utility and the use of the results. So creating one-page reports are one way to increase that utility of your evaluation. So a single page, a single one-page report won't always meet all of your needs for different stakeholders. 
So sometimes you might think about creating multiple one-page reports that would meet those unique needs for different groups. So I'm gonna hand it over to Emma now, and she's gonna talk us through the first couple of steps of how you can create a one-page report. Well, thanks, Lissa, and welcome to everyone from the Eval Fest group. We're so excited to be here with you. Um, so hopefully that beginning session has gotten you interested in creating a one-page report, um, but let's talk about how to actually create those reports. So that's what I'm gonna walk through the first couple of steps with you. So we've created a simple 10 page, 10, sorry, not 10 page, 10 step process um, to follow in order to make this applicable to you as a user. Um, we actually created this while creating one page, uh, a one pager, sorry. Um, so as you can see, the 10 steps are pretty straightforward and this uh, handout is available on our website along with all the other resources we'll be showing you here today. In addition to the um, handout we created, we also went ahead and made a worksheet and we um, did this based on our experience um, because we found that the handout was very helpful, but having this availability to fill in information as we went along in the creation really helped us go back and look back at what we had written and what decisions we had made about the different steps. So in order to make this webinar applicable to um, you guys as the Eval Fest audience, we actually reached out to a group in our ATE community to get a real evaluation report that wasn't authored by us to apply these steps to to create a one pager from a full evaluation report. So this report came to us from South Seattle College and in the report total recluded 31 pages. So in order to make create a useful one page, we actually reached out to the evaluator and the project team um, that the project was about and asked them um, steps one through three, which I'll go over in just a moment, to help ensure that this report would be very useful to them as the end user. So the first step in creating a one-page report is identify the audience. So the client at South Yellow College identified the, college, the audience for the one-page report as college administrators and the greater community. So those will be our primary audience. Since NSF is the funded funder for the project, we also included NSF as a secondary audience. And you at US, uh, Eval Fest also have NSF, so some of this will be applicable to you as well. So this is the section of the South Seattle College worksheet. And as you can see, I wrote down the audience, but I also made a note to myself, and you can see it here, that I need to provide project level information and basically basic background on the program as well, since this will be going to an audience that may know little about the project. So keep this in mind anytime you're building a one pager that may be going out to the general public. And we'll touch back on this in a moment. So the next step is identifying the purpose. And this is a very simple idea, but has definitely saved us time during the production of our one-page report. Um, the ideal is to write a purpose statement for your one-page report, just like you would for a program or a project. So this is the purpose statement that was provided to us by our client that we asked for. And we went ahead and expanded on it a little bit to give us a better understanding of the scope of our one-pager. So as you can see here, we expanded it to to present an evaluative summary of what activities the project is doing and the strengths and achievements the project has made. So now we have a really clear focus um, on the purpose of what this one pager is all about. So when writing the purpose statement for your one page report, you wanna keep in mind the scope. So this report is intentionally one page and you don't want to over promise the amount of information that can be easily digested. So something to keep in mind for the purpose statement is for a one-page report, not for the project or the evaluation. So don't leave your, let yourself get swept away by wanting to include too much information and making the scope too big, saying you want to create a one-page report on the entire evaluation report, but you wanna be careful not to go too small where you aren't reporting enough information and the document isn't useful. It's really a Goldilocks method that takes some practice, but we will help you out in figuring out the balance of your scope in our next step. So that next step is prioritize the information. So for this step, I'm actually going to go, uh, go to a, share a quick example that I love from Cole Knopfloch's book, Storytelling with Data. So in Cole's book, is about using data to tell a story. And if you haven't already read Cole's book or heard about Cole and storytelling data, I highly recommend it. So the example she uses is about searching for pearls and oysters. 
So you're trying to find a pearl and you open a 100 oysters and you end up finding three pearls. So you can relate to this to data collection. You have hours and hours of data collection and analysis conducted on your project to discover three important findings. All of the data is reported in traditional evaluation reports to include the 100 oysters with three pearls. There are callouts for the meaningful data pieces shown here. But as you can see, there is a lot of additional oysters on this page that are taking away from the really meaningful data point that the report should be communicating. So you can pull all of those out of the long form report and put them in a one page report. So instead of having a report with 100 oysters and three pieces of meaningful data, you have one report that highlights the three important findings, allowing the information to be easily understood and used. So we're gonna do the same idea, take that same practice and apply it to our South Seattle example. So we were asked by the client to provide them with a visual executive summary. And when prioritizing the information, the first step is to go back to our worksheet and look at the step one, the identified audience. So remember that note I made earlier on the worksheet? Given our audience, I identified that we need to add the project background and the mission to the one-page report. So here is the executive summary of the South Seattle College report, and highlighted is the background information for the one-page report. We also want to look at step two from our worksheet. What is the purpose of the one-page report? We want to focus on the activities, strengths, and achievements. So we will go back to the executive summary and identify those pearls we want to pull out. So highlighted here, you can see we have uh, information about enrollment goals and specifically those about females and veterans in the program. So given our audience of college administrators and the funder, NSF, this information is a good fit for our one-page report. There are three areas total. So total students enrolled, female students, and veteran students. So after reviewing the rest of the executive summary and the rest of the evaluation report, I realized additional data points on the program quality and utility would help round out the overall project view. So I identified two uh, additional sections to pull into this one page report, including quality and utility further in the report. And these aspects of the program speak to the success and the achievements and align with our purpose statement. So this brings me to a tip that we actually came uh, to when we were creating these one page reports is don't get stuck by limiting yourself based on your initial assumption of what you want to report on. So I was planning on only using the executive summary to make the one page report, but it turned out that I wanted to pull more information from the remainder of the evaluation report to make this a more useful one page. So what other information should be included on our one page report? Well, we recommend in the header information that you include the institutional logo, the date the report was created on, and the title of the report. And then in the footer information, we encourage you to add any author credits. So if you're not the original author of the report, go ahead and put that there. Uh, the data source, so you can absolutely link out to the long form report, that 30 page report that Karen wrote, you can put that right in there. Um, and then you also want to include any funder information. So for our case, and a lot of your cases probably, you have a funder like NSF, so you want to include that basic information in the footer. So now that we've identified the content, let's start considering some of the visual elements for our one pager. So this brings us to step four, choose a grid. So the brain, the human brain is really good at recognizing patterns, even when we're not aware of it. And it also means it's easily distracted or thrown off when things are not in a recognizable pattern. Even small misalignments can confuse the brain and distract it from truly absorbing and comprehending the data of your one page report. Using a grid layout can help organize and align elements for your brain and it's an easy format from which to start from. So there are many of options available for assisting with alignment, but we find grids to be the easiest to use and really helpful. We have created 11 grids which are available for download on our website. And for this example, the South Seattle report that we're showing you, I selected the 12 by 12 grid because it has a large amount of boxes and provides me with flexibility to create more areas within my assigned sections. 
Once the grids are selected, uh, you will map your prioritized information onto the grid. And so remember, you're just going to work right off your worksheet for that. So as you can see, I've created individual sections on the top of the grid to work on the layout. So now we're going to move on to step five, draft the layout. And this, we encourage you to make sure not to skip this step. So we actually encourage you to go ahead and print out a piece of paper and sketch out your envision of the, what the different sections may look like. So you will do this based on your mapping of the prioritized information in the previous step. And we don't, you don't need to be Da Vinci or an artist or a graphic design expert to do this. Just get the basic idea on paper. And the reason we recommend this step is that you are able to identify sections that may not work. For instance, you may think you'll be able to fit three charts in one section, but once you get it sketched, you realize you only have room for two. So by sketching in advance, you save yourself time and energy by not creating elements on the computer you ultimately won't use. So here is my sketch of the one-page report that we've been working on. And this gives a basic idea of whether my ideas are gonna work on paper or not. So you may need to do a few sketches before you're able to move on to the next step, but that's okay. And we do that a lot, actually. Um, so it's much faster to sketch on paper than to create a one-page report digitally and then have to change it. So, so we have converted, um, so sorry, you will convert uh, this one-page report into our digital report on the computer once you're ready and all set with your design. Um, so that actually brings us to the end of step five. So we are gonna actually hand things over to Lissa to take you through step six through 10. Thanks, Emma. So Emma has got a really great first draft of this report already, but let's talk about some final steps that we can make it even better. So Emma uh, was just pointing out the importance of making intentional design decisions to implicitly tell the reader what's most important when she was talking about the use of grids. And another way to do this is by creating an intentional visual path for your reader. So when we're talking about a visual path, we're referring to the order of the objects that a reader looks at when they're viewing the page. Where do they look first? What elements on that page really draw their attention? So to illustrate this idea, we wanna show you two short videos. So in this first video, you're gonna see a data dashboard you see on the screen now. And when I click start to start the video, a blue circle is gonna appear on the page, indicating the order of what the average reader looks at. So this video comes from a series of eye tracking studies from Tableau, and they aggregated the eye movements of multiple readers using a computer software to determine what elements really catch readers' attention. So let's go ahead and press play on this. So you can see the red dot starts in the top left corner and then is grabbed by some of the red bar graphs, the big 35. It goes back down to the blue uh, graph and then um, back around left and up back to the top. Let's play that one more time, because I know it goes by pretty quick. So you really see that areas of high contrast, blocks of color, and the large text are really grabbing readers' attention. It's also interesting to note in this one, the sections where um, the readers don't really look at, so the top right box, the outbound close rate percentage, you can see no one really paid attention to. And so if you're thinking about your own one pager, you wanna ensure that your visual path is including all of the most important parts that you want your reader to look at. So let's look at one more quick video from the same eye tracking study. So in this video, instead of a blue dot, when I press play, the screen is gonna turn completely black and then the data dashboard will slowly be revealed the more readers look at a certain spot. So let's press play and see what patterns emerge. There we go. So again, you can see that readers are really looking at those blue bar graphs, they appear first, and then the big numbers on the top of the screen, even this uh, green area chart down in the bottom right-hand corner. Play it one more time. So in thinking about your pages, you wanna make sure that you're using these in order to lead readers to the most important information first, right? Because your, your stakeholder is really busy and in reading their report, you want to make sure that their eyes are attracted to the most impor important information first. So the big takeaways from these videos and similar studies are that size, color, and ink density are the most important aspects to think about when creating your visual path. 
So you want to use these elements intentionally to lead your readers to the information that you actually prioritize back in step number three. So let's apply this to our example at the South Seattle College. So we're going to take a look back at step three, where we prioritize the mission and background, enrollment goals, quality, and utility of the program. So here you see again the, the computerized, the digital version of our current draft that Emma created. And so she actually started us out with this. So she handed it to me and I did a quick informal eye tracking study of my own. So you can see that my eyes started in the top left hand corner with the title and then they were really drawn to this bottom right hand corner because the graphs there were a lot of colors. So my eyes really went there and then they slowly went back up to these dot plots and across the page. But you might be able to tell that I didn't look at the title of this page at all, and I didn't look at the background information. So this could be a problem because like we identified before, our readers might not be immediately familiar with the program. So skipping over the title and the background might lead to some confusion about what they're even reading. So to try and address that, we made some small changes. So we turned some of the title and the text blue in order to catch readers' attention. We also decided that there was a lot of blue ink in that bottom right-hand corner with these bar graphs, really just hogging the reader's attention, but not telling the reader much. Especially, we started looking at these numbers, and we realized that the difference between the graphs was one less than one-tenth of a point. So what is that really showing us? So instead, Emma and I went back and we reanalyzed the data into three overarching categories that students found most useful about the program, and we highlighted these using icons. So the intentional use of icons to convey information and not just for decorative purposes have actually shown in studies to increase readers' memory of the associated data. And then we also spread the explanatory text of the utility section across the top so that there is an unused corner of the document in our visual path. So our new visual path distributes attention better across this page and it's in better alignment with the information that we prioritized. So another major design choice that helps the reader is to use a purposeful hierarchy. So in step six, we talked about the graphical elements. So let's turn our focus to the text elements a little bit. So visual hierarchy is a way to get the brain one step ahead of the eyes. Using text size and font to uniquely identify leveled headings allows your reader to understand the content before they actually read it. Studies have shown that using differentiated headings helps remind readers helps readers remember information in tests of immediate and delayed recall, as well as aid in their actual comprehension of what they're reading. Studies have also shown that readers perceive the font size as the most important cue to the hierarchy of information, more so than even position, case, or even underlining. So remember to use these things to your advantage. So if we look back at our South Seattle College example, we actually wanted to match our fonts and colors to the college's visual identity. So we just did a quick Google search and we found these branding guidelines and they gave us the color, the college's color palette along with their preferred fonts. So we use this and we use the worksheet to write down a quick style guide. So it might seem um, silly to make a full style guide for just a one page report, but honestly we can say that it's actually really helpful in double checking your details when you're creating new elements and ensuring that you're staying consistent across the page. So here you can see that we use that. We have a bigger um, text size for the heading one with a smaller text size for the heading two. And then the text for the body and the graphs are even smaller because that's details that we want the reader to look at secondary instead of first. So the third design element to help organize the information for your reader's use is the use of white space. So again, your brain subconsciously views things and it understands content grouped together as a cohesive unit. So when you add white space, it indicates to the brain, hey, I'm starting something new here. Even without actually having to read the content, you can tell that here there are six different sections. If I add even more white space, your brain can actually tell that there are three main sections with two subsections each. So let's look at how we spread our white space out in the South Seattle College example. So since we're not always used to intentionally looking at white space, sometimes it can like blend into the background, which it is supposed to do when you are generally looking at a page. But for the purpose of this webinar, we wanna make sure that you're looking at the same white space that we're looking at. So we actually turned all the white space yellow, just like that. 
So now that you're looking at the white space, which is now highlighted yellow, you can tell that we have big chunks of white space at the bottom, right, surrounding those icons, but they're not really intentional. We're not really doing anything with it. But then the space in between the content sections that we want readers to subconsciously group together, we have different size white space. So we're gonna go ahead and spread that out across the different sections. So it's looking a lot better now, right? So we have standardized sections of white space between our main content areas. You can see it right there. So the trick with white space is really just finding a happy medium. Sometimes you have to play around with it until it feels right. But if you don't put enough white space, all of your information is really squished, like the example on the left. But if you have too much white space, it seems like all of your elements are too far apart and your re reader really can't connect the different elements in the page, like the example on the right. So again, you wanna balance out that white space to tell the reader where the content breaks are and allow their eyes to quickly scan across the page. So step nine is get feedback. This is probably the most important step in the process. So when creating any type of report, more eyes are always better. So Emma and I, Emma actually created the first draft we're working with. So she handed it to me for our initial internal review. So here you have, you can see some of the edits I made. And I suggested some things like making the dots on these dot graphs bigger, right? Because this is like whether or not the project has achieved their goals. That's really important information and we don't want the readers to accidentally skip by it. I also suggested changing the conversation icon in order to balance out the visual path because it was really pretty ink dense. My eyes still kept being dragged to that bottom left. So you can see we made a few of these changes. There you go. And then we also wanted to make sure that we got an external feedback. So we handed this to our client and she noted some different word changes and she went back to the main report which she had written and she made sure that it was accurately representing all of her data and her findings. So overall, she was really happy with how it turned out and she appreciated how much information we actually boiled down onto a single page. So like most things, the steps to creating a one-page report isn't as linear in practice. So with the feedback from the client, we had to actually go back to step five to sometimes you have to go back to step five to redraft the layout. And if you do that, you wanna make sure that you continue through the other steps, creating a visual path, rechecking your purposeful hierarchy and reallocating your white space. And so sometimes this can be a little loop until you get it to where you want it. So here you can see our first draft prior to any internal or external feedback, and then our final draft after the feedback. So your absolute last step should, before you finalize your one page, should always be triple checking their consistency. You wanna make sure that the fonts you're using, the alignment type you're using, font size, even image size and colors are really consistent across your page. Small inconsistencies in these can actually lead a, question, lead a reader to question the quality of your finished product and sometimes it can even go back to their trust in your data. So you wanna make sure that people trust your work and you always make a final triple check. So we actually like using the worksheet that we put out to triple check some of these. So here you can see a side-by-side -side of the executive summary before and then the one-page report that we created after. So this one-page report was created for college administrators and the general community who might not be familiar with the project in order to share an evaluative summary of what activities the project is doing and the achievements the project has made. I'm gonna hand it over to Emma um, to share some quick tips and tricks, and then we're gonna go into a question session. So make sure you keep track of questions that you might have in your chat or just some different things you wanna talk about. Well, thanks, and we hope you uh, enjoyed walking through the steps and we really found um, that when we present this that we get a lot of common questions that come up. So instead of just making you guys ask us during the question break, we formed this tips and tricks section um, to have something for you also to take away with you at the end of this. So we're just gonna walk through some common questions we get. Um, so the first one is what software do we use to create our one page report? Very common one we always get. Um, and we actually use Microsoft PowerPoint um, and the reason we chose that is that compared to Word, um, PowerPoint's much easier to move objects around and align things. Um, so one trick we have in using PowerPoints 
is actually creating multiple drafts in one file. And you can see it's in, in quotations there. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a second. So while creating one page reports, it's really, really um, a good practice to create multiple drafts as you go. And you can easily do this using PowerPoint by duplicating the slide. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through how we do that. So this is just a, an example draft of our one pager. And you can see we're, we're down on like slide 26 by now or something like that. Um, so you're simply gonna right click on your slide viewer there. And that will bring you up to a pop-up option. I'm sure mo many of you already know how to do this, but you're just gonna click on duplicate the slide there. And then you have your next draft. And this is just an overview of our process for creating this on page report. And as you can see, we walk all the way through our grid being implemented there. Uh, Liz is doing her visual tracking. We're checking white space. Oh, we're back to white space. We're doing a visual tracking again. And then the last bottom row is really just tweaking, tweaking, tweaking. And that is really crucial for creating a one pager because if Lisa comes back to me with feedback and says, I really don't like what you did here. I simply just drop back to draft number four, like 24 there, um, versus having to open up five or six files in my file, you know, bin. Um, I can easily just flip back slides and say, oh, is this the one you meant? <laughs> and it's super easy when working with uh, external clients as well, because you can just throw them the whole slide deck and say, which one did you like or what's not working here? So that's a quick tip and trick we like to use there. So for our graphs and uh, charts, we use Microsoft Excel. Um, it works well with PowerPoint, it's easily accessible and it gets the job done. Um, we don't go much into graph design in this presentation purposefully, um, but you, if you do have questions, you can always feel free to contact us or ask us in the chat. Um, so within PowerPoint, you're probably wondering how we use that to make one page report. Um, so we um, just have to change the slide size. So you're not going to give your clients an odd size. We can go ahead and give them that eight and a half by 11 letter size. So to do that, you're going to simply um, have your document open. You're going to go to the design tab up top where the arrow is pointing there. And you're going to go over to slide size. Many people probably didn't even know that was there, but it is. And we're going to go to customize slide size. And a new window is going to pop up and we're simply going to adjust that over to our slide size that we need. And we're gonna adjust it to a 7.5 by 10. Um, so uh, PowerPoint automatically is gonna give us that one inch border there. So there we go, 7.5 by 10, we are all set. And now you can see the document behind there is a letter size document that is uh, vertically aligned there. Perfect for a piece of paper to print off. You can also do this um, uh, layout portrait portrait style as well, is that right? Mm -hmm. I have it backwards, landscape and portrait, um, whichever way you wanna go, but that way it'll print on a standard size piece of paper versus being a little odd with a PowerPoint slide. So another great tip is in uh, PowerPoint is being able to utilize the rulers and guides and how to make them visible. So PowerPoint has their own built-in rulers and guides that are super helpful to help align your objects. And to turn those on, you're gonna go to the view tab, you're gonna to go to click on ruler and then click on guide. Speaking of aligning objects, that is like a crucial thing when creating a one pager. Remember we talked about that. Your brain recognizes those patterns and nothing bothers me more when I look at an object, uh, you know, one pager and things are not aligned. So let's teach you guys, I'm sure some of you know this, but let's run over how to align objects really quickly in PowerPoint. So the key piece to this is you need to select the items that you want to align. So we're working on the bottom there, you can see the arrow. We selected all three of our icons there on the bottom row. Once those are selected, the format tab will appear. Go ahead and click on that format tab and that's gonna get you the arrange button there. Arrange is gonna give you several options, but the one we're gonna zoom in on is the align button down there. And once we get to align, you're gonna go and choose which alignment you want. This will align all of your objects across the middle there and you can see they've been distributed across the middle on an alignment. So you don't have to go in and manually do that yourself. Another great step in there, same spot, you're gonna select your icons, you're gonna go back up to format, down to arrange, and down to align, and then distribute horizontally. By using this, that is actually gonna take those icons and distribute those with even white space between the middle. Remember, Alyssa talked about that crucial point of having that white space. Well, we can do that automatically now with PowerPoint. 
This also works for text boxes, charts, anything really you can select in PowerPoint, you can go ahead and use this. You've got distribute horizontally and distribute vertically. I know for myself, I use this daily on everything I'm doing. So these are really great tips and tricks. Um, and the final one we get often um, is how to save it once we're done in PowerPoint. Um, we do encourage you to go ahead and save this down as a PDF for sharing, just because different file versions of PowerPoint can sometimes alter your formatting. Um, so in order to save this down as a PDF, you do not need a PDF software to do this. You're going to go to your uh, home tab in PowerPoint, then go over to your print menu. Once you're in your print menu, you're going to um, go here to the print to PDF. You'll have some version of this. Each computer is a little different depending on what you have, but you should have a print to PDF option. Once you select that, you're going to adjust the quality of your document. So you're gonna hit um, the full page slide option there. That's gonna bring you to the quality menu. And you can see I've got the high quality button checked and that's really crucial for getting this one page to print right. So once we have that checked, you're all set to go. Um, one piece um, of side information I don't have a visual on, but on the Mac, you want to select that it doesn't add additional margins on there. And if you want to follow up with me for Mac users um, to clarify on that, I can absolutely provide clarification. So the final one, I lied, I had one more tip mm -hmm. after that last one, um, is where we find our icons. Um, and we have lots of good resources. PowerPoint 2016 has just released, uh, just about a year ago, released a new icon package that is built into PowerPoint that you can use. Um, icon Finder is great. And all of these um, quick resources like this are available on the back of our handout um, on our website. Um, but we actually have a new product that we are really excited about. It's called the Noun Project. It's got over 1 million icons that are royalty free, free to use. The great thing about it is you can change the color right in the program before you download. Um, so it's a, if you're planning on using a lot of icons, it may be worth um, the small investment um, to get a subscription to this. This is what we now use for all of our projects. And as you can see here, I typed in the word computer and I've got like 26,000 uh, responses from the system of all different types of computers, from your computer towers to your monitors. So it really has saved us a lot of time in the creation of our PowerPoint slides and our one pagers and, and our evaluation, 50 page evaluation reports. We can use all these icons. Um, so that's a great, a great one to know about. Like I said, tons more resources on photos, icons, all on our website available for you guys to use. So that's actually bringing us to the end of the webinar. We really hope that you get excited about the possibility of creating a one-page report and that we've given you the tools to create one on your own. Uh, remember, creating a one-page report isn't about making your evaluation report pretty. It's about increasing the engagement, use, and understanding of your data. So that actually brings us to the end. We're gonna go ahead and turn things back over to Taylor um, to field any questions that you guys might have for us on this content. Uh, one second while we figure out how to turn it back over to Taylor. <laughs> Thank you guys, this is Karen. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody has questions that they're gonna type in, I have a quick question about how to use the, the grid templates that you guys have. Um, so I love those because when I think about creating a one pager myself, I think the most intimidating part is getting started. So to have something with lines on it that I could color in to create my sections and think about um, moving through is fantastic. I wondered if you recommend, um, if you recommend using the electronic version of that, uh, or if you prefer to rely on the grid lines that you can add in through PowerPoint to make sure that you're getting your layout right. Um, and so how do you usually like to work with the transition between the hard copy worksheets that you've created and using grid lines in PowerPoint itself? Yeah, great question, Karen. And I actually do both. So I will print out my grid and use that to create my draft. 
Um, but then actually when I go into PowerPoint, I apply that same grid. Um, so our grids are available online and just they're just image files. So I lay that right over and I use that to align my PowerPoint. And actually um, those overview slides I showed you earlier, you can see like um, previously down in like the lower slides, I kept putting my grid back up. So I have it there and I just, I remove it from view when I'm designing and then I'll put it back on to ensure um, that I'm aligned right, but I also do use um, those guides and rulers that we showed you as well, just to ensure that, you know, like you said, sometimes your grid might not be set perfectly. So I do go back through as our final sweep to make sure everything is still aligned well with the PowerPoint guides that are built in as well. Awesome. Did I answer that Thanks. okay? Yeah, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Taylor, yeah. any other questions from the crew? Yes, we've got two. So the first one is from Rachel, and she wants to know, um, are there any cheap or easy to use programs to do the eye tracking? Ah, that is a good question. Um, we don't know of any. I think, you know, because I think the computer programs that do the eye tracking are like scanning readers retina and then watching what point they're looking at. So I don't think that comes cheap, but I just did it Whereas like I hadn't seen it before. So Emma designed the draft and then gave it to me. And then I intentionally, you know, when I first saw the, the draft said, okay, where does my eye go? And sometimes, you know, you can actually do that yourself pretty well. Yeah, and what I, what I do too, I just was working on some feedback for one pagers this morning and I actually take a blank piece of paper and I put it over the document and then I remove it really quick. And that's how I, you know, Liz is sitting here laughing at me, but I do. And it actually works because it, it, it makes your brain readjust and say, oh, this is right where I'm going. And I literally go through and I mark it like one, I'm here. And then two, I went here. And sometimes I have to do it a couple times to get, you know, if I have to go to five and six, but that actually works really well. Like um, if you're not able to get that software, because like Liz has said, Tableau has that, and it's it's not something that we know is out on the market yet. And our second question comes from Jordan, and he wants to know, what are your thoughts on symmetry versus asymmetry as far as attracting folks' attention? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think they both can work for different reasons. I think they're, so we didn't dive full on into the, the cognitive processes of actual design, right? And this is where the symmetry and asymmetry go. Um, I think, you know, balancing your sheet out well, I guess it determines on the purpose and what you're trying to do with your one pager. Are you trying to give a lot of information and you're giving equal weight to the different information? So you want to use symmetry in order to have your reader's eyes flow around the page and making sure they're actually looking at everything you're presenting? Or do you really want their their attention to go to one big thing? This works a lot with like, you know, social media posts or uh, posters or flyers for events where you want maybe the information or the title to be really big in one corner and then maybe only have some small information in, in the bottom or another corner so it's asymmetric, right? A lot of weight is placed on one side because you want to give a lot of attention to that one side. And we have Thank you guys. one more question from Leanne that just came in. Um, it says, choosing appropriate icons for a client when they are more complex, figuring out matching size for icons that are slightly different. Yeah, that's actually a really great, great question. I think icons, like, so for the first question, um, choosing an icon is always really hard. I think both Emma and I spend a lot of time choosing the right icon because you want to make sure that it's culturally responsive you want to make sure that it doesn't really mean something different to your viewers. Um, but sometimes we also try and be a little clever about it and we try and make the icon itself a joke. I can't think of a good example right now, but you know, if you, if you're having the icon recall something that is then attached to what you're talking about. But I would say in presenting data, we do that more in presentations in presenting data in a one page report, you want to make sure that you're using your icon to help convey the information. There are actually studies out there that have looked at, you know, 
people who use icons or images in the background of data more as decoration, and that's actually detracting from people's understanding and memory of that information, whereas if you use it intentionally to say, you know, this is this object, there's more, I'm just thinking of sharks right now because that's the example they use in the article, but, you know, to say that there's more sharks than octopus, you know, it really helps readers to uh, match the content and the information with the data. And then in terms of matching size icons that are slightly different, I think it's really hard. The Noun Project, though, does have um, a, uh, what's that called, like? Collection? Well, it, it like goes into the into PowerPoint. Oh, I see. And then when you're importing the icon straight from this, oh, plugin, it's called a plugin. Yes. A plugin into PowerPoint. And when you're downloading that icon, it'll actually allow you to choose different sizes. So if that size works for you, um, it's a really great way to keep the icons similar. But we've also noticed that different icons have different size white space around them. So the box of the object might actually not be the same size as the object. So a quick trick that we do is we actually put the two icons on top of each other. And then we kind of align like, okay, do the edges seem to match up? from the left and right and top and bottom. And then we'll separate those and use the horizontal vertical alignment tools in PowerPoint in order to make sure that they're aligned correctly. And, and one other thing, I, I mentioned this earlier to not answer Liz's question for me, um, but non-project and other things have collections, which is really good um, to find similar icons. So like, if, for example, in our one page that we showed you, I had an icon that was like extremely ink dense, but the other two were simply outlines. And so that was, you know, finding icons that are similarly looking like that, definitely a larger icon bank with those collections can certainly help with that. Um, and we found those to be really helpful in choosing our icons and saving us a lot of time. So hopefully that answered that question, Deanne. Any other questions? All right, well, feel free. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Emma and I via email. Um, our email should be available. Uh, otherwise, we will hand it back to Karen. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, I, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> I hope everybody else who's out there listening is too. Um, and I think that there are a lot of ways that we can all think about taking even teeny pieces, but but probably everything that you guys have shared today and applying them to our next festival reports. So that's kind of cool, especially a lot of us just wrapped up the spring festival season. So reporting is probably the next thing coming down the pike. Other things coming down the pike. Um, Relate back to sort of the announcement I made up front today. So Taylor, if you go to the next slide real fast. Um, obviously, we have the Science Events Summit coming up in about three weeks. We're hoping to see many of you there. We are not sure what the rest of the summer is going to look like with regard to webinars. We know that we're not going to have one in June, since we, hopefully many of us, will be together in St. Petersburg. July and August, we don't usually have them. In the, in the past, we haven't, but this year, we're hoping to. So as I mentioned at the top of the hour, we uh, our supplement for uh, additional funding that would give you guys more professional development and allow us to hold um, two additional annual meetings has been recommended for funding. We have one final hurdle to clear, so we're not funded yet, but we're getting closer. And if that happens, then we would do July and August webinars that would be very professional development oriented. They would focus on analysis and reporting. Those would set us up for our next um, uh, annual meeting. And um, Amanda McCulloch will be back to talk to us about data storytelling. So you can think about building on what Lissa and Emma shared with us today, wrapping it in with the training you've already gotten from Amanda, and think about how we might get to learn more together in September. So that's where we're hoping to go. Um, as soon as we know something for sure, we'll let you guys all know so that we can start thinking about when and how we're going to get to spend time together over the summer or into the fall. And I think that is it for today. Huge thank you again to Emma and to Lissa for all of the tips and tricks and uh, to Taylor for helping drive and organize everything today. We hope to see you all in St. Petersburg in a few weeks time, or if not, then online again over the summer. Bye everybody. <laughs>